Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. Thanks for listening. You can follow Bleeding Daylight wherever you find podcasts and never miss an episode. Please connect with Bleeding Daylight on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And please share this and other episodes with others. His parents were told they should abandon him. They didn't listen. And he's been ignoring every limitation ever since. I can't wait to introduce you to my guest today and let him tell you his incredible story. Dorsey Ross was born with a severe congenital disability. Doctors gave his parents no hope for his survival and advised them to put him into an institution. Now in his mid-40s, Dorsey has proved the doctors wrong, but life still has been full of challenges. He's been told that so many of the milestones that most of us take for granted would be impossible for him. He's refused to listen. It's an honour to welcome him to Bleeding Daylight. Dorsey, thank you so much for your time. Rodney, thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate this time and this opportunity to be on your show. I'm wondering if you can start by telling us about the disability that you have and what are the effects for you? Sure. I was born uh, with a, as you said, congenital birth defect called Aplet syndrome, which is a birth defect of the hands and the face. And when I was born, my forehead was pushed out with my eyes and nose were pushed back into my head and my fingers and toes refused to get at me. I had no individual movement of them. And one of the other issues was the fact that I had no skull opening and no room for my brain to grow. And the doctors initially told my parents because I had no skull opening and no room for my brain to grow, that I would eventually become brain dead and the best option for them would be to put me into a institution and to let me be because the doctors initially thought I would eventually become brain dead and probably possibly even die at some point. So tell me about your parents at this stage. They've been given this enormous shock and the doctors are saying there's no hope of survival. And I know you can only tell from, from what they've told you, but what was their reaction back then? They were in shock and awe, you know, as, as I can imagine. But you know what? They believed in God and they have faith in God and they said, you know, look, we're not going to give up on the son that God has given us. We believe that God has a plan and a purpose for our son, and we're going to take him home and we'll see what what's going to happen. And one of the cooler things about this time with my parents is the fact that my dad went down the hallway in the hospital to pray about what he was going to do and how he was going to handle this situation with a, a baby boy that you know, may or may not survive. And my mom was 41, my dad was 45 at the time. So this, you know, although they knew they were pregnant and they knew that they were going to expect a a baby, the prognosis of their son having a deformity came out of nowhere because they didn't have the testing like they do now where they can prognosis, well, he's going to be born with X, Y, and Z, so we can prepare now before, you know, this child is going to be born. Well, my parents didn't have that, so my dad went down the hallway to pray. He said he felt, you know, the Holy Spirit, I believe was the Holy Spirit said to him, or God said to him, be still, be still, relax, be calm, and know that I have everything in control. And even one of the nurses at the hospital told my parents that doctors at Colonel Presbyterian Hospital in, in New York City, where I, where I grew up, 
were doing operations on babies like me and that they could give my parents a better prognosis of what they could do for me. Uh, it's one of those situations where, as you mentioned, the, the testing wasn't really available pre-birth back then, but I imagine that these days, if people found that sort of problem with a child before it was born, that the suggestion is always these days to just terminate and we lose the opportunity to, well, to meet people like you. Right. I would definitely say that that's probably a, a big possibility that doctors or nurses say, let's terminate. But I know a lot of people, although it's a very rare birth defect, I know a lot of people that have the same birth defect that I do. And for the most part, we're all doing fairly fairly well, you know, health-wise and being able to do all the things that we're capable of doing. And I know for myself, doctors said I wouldn't live past the age of 18, and I'm now 44. Doctors said he'll have to wear braces on his legs because I had fused toes and wouldn't be able to walk right. But I, I walk, I run, I do all the things that regular everyday people do, even in even sports, although some of those sports were adaptive because I was on, mostly on teams with people with disabilities, I was able to do all those things. And again, we can only go on the memories of your parents from when you were very small, but what was life like for them as they started to bring you into this big new world when you were just a baby? What difficulties did they encounter back at that time? Yeah, well, they they encountered all the operations that they had to help their son to go through. I had my first operation at six weeks of age to open the skull and to allow my brain to grow and to allow my brain to function normally. From about six weeks to about five years old, I had about around 10 operations, and some of them, some of those operations, they lasted up to 10 hours at a time or maybe even more. My dad would go off to work, and my mom would have to take me to, to the doctor and even at times stay in the hospital with me. I remember the time where she would sleep on the floor, sleep on the chair next to me, in the in the hospital room. So a lot of your early memories would be around those visits to the hospital. I know that very early days there was up to 10 operations, but you've been through a lot more since then, haven't you? I have. I've been, throughout my lifetime, I've been through 68 operations, and the last one was not because of my disability so much, it was just because I was clumsy and I was going up the stairs and, my colleague and I tripped and fell, and I actually broke my arm, and I had to have it put back in place, basically, with pins. Because of my arms, I can't lift my hands above my head, and my arms are very, not restrictive so much, but they're, you know, there's only so much I can do with my arms because of the circulation of my hands. They had to put pins on my arms, and... So I had that back in college, and that was when that was the last operation that I that I had. What was life like for you as you're growing up? Obviously, a lot of time spent with doctors, spent in hospital. But did you have any chance at a normal childhood with playing with other kids and and that sort of thing? Oh, absolutely! I did. I definitely did. If I wasn't upstairs doing homework, I was outside playing football in the street with the guys and playing baseball in the street with the guy who were going on bike rides with my dad and with my friends into the park and doing everyday things like all normal boys would. You know, we would play, unfortunately we can't do it now, but back in the day they would have Cowboys and Indians, or good guys and bad guys with toy guns running in, running in the street. I did all of that. I had that type of experience growing up, thankfully. But I also had the type of experience growing up 
where people would tease me and people would make fun of me and people would call me names like Monster and Freak. And this not only happened in the neighborhood, but it also happened in the school that I went to. And the sad part about that school was the fact that it was a school for people with disabilities. We each had our own disability, yet there were still kids in that school that would make fun of other kids. There's a certain cruelty with kids that when young, people just say what comes into their mind without the thought of of who it's going to hurt. But it's particularly interesting. You're saying that at a school for kids with disabilities, those that you would expect most of all to understand hurtful comments are actually making hurtful comments against you and, and perhaps some of the others. Is it hard for you to understand how they could do that in a situation where they've been on the other end of those comments? Yeah, you, you know, you would think that they wouldn't do something like that, but they, unfortunately, they did. It comes down to the old saying, hurt people hurt people. And I think that whether you're someone with a disability and you're hurting other people or whether you're just, you know, a regular person saying hurtful things, I think if you go back into that person's history and that person's life, you're going to find that somewhere along that line, they have been hurt by somebody else. And that's why they're hurting other people. So as your schooling continues, how, how did you go at school? I mean, it's obvious, by the way, that you're talking, that you're a, an educated man, but it must have been difficult to get that education in between a lot of doctor's visits and hospital visits and, and the care that you needed to have. So how was education for you back in those days? Well, thank you for that question and for saying that I'm an educated person, and I, and I am to a, to a point. But growing up, as far as my education goes, it was very difficult. For me, I wouldn't do well on certain tests. I wouldn't do well in certain classes. Even in junior high school, I had to take an extra year in junior high school because I didn't do well in certain classes. And I had a learning disability and different things of that nature. And even going back to my younger years, I would have to be what they call today being homeschooled. Because I was in the hospital and I was missing a lot of time in school and would have to come home and recuperate before even going back. So they had to send a special teacher to the house to teach me what the other kids were learning in the classroom at that time. So I wouldn't make miss too much schooling. So that was a lot, wasn't able to keep up with a lot of things. And so I was having a lot of problems with school and I would wonder what would I do after I graduated high school, just like everyone else, I wanted to see what else I was able to do. I believed that God had a plan and purpose for my life and that God had greater things in store for my life. So I wonder what was that next step in the process of my life to see what I would do after I graduated. And I was at this meeting to determine what I was going to do. And my mom was there with me. And my high school history teacher was there as well. And he was asked, you know, do you think that Dorsey will be able to make it in college? And he said, no, I don't think that Dorsey will be able to make it in college. I don't think he has the ability to make it in college. My mom was then, she said, well, or they would ask her, what do you think? She said, well, if Dorsey think he can make it, he will. Regardless of what the teacher said, I went on to Queensborough Community College to study liberal arts to see what I could do. With that. So even though you're being told all the way along that there are things that you can't do, you're refusing to believe them. I, I find it very interesting that you certainly had your mum on your side to be able to say, hey, if, if Dorsey believes that he can do it, because so often we will cave to the expectation of others. And when others are saying, no, don't bother trying, we can sometimes just 
give up. It takes an enormous amount of courage to be able to say, well, I'm going to fight for what I want. What are some of the other ways in which you had to fight back against expectations of others? I think one of the other expectations was in my life, my life saying is can't is not in my vocabulary. In other words, I don't use the word can't a lot, if at all. And when I say that, it's because I don't put barriers in front of me to stop me from doing what it is that I want to do. If I would say to you, Robin, hey, I'm going to go and do this, and you would look at me and say, well, Dorsey, you got stuffed fingers. You only have nine fingers, and you want to go and do rock climbing. I don't think you can do that. Well, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to go and try and do that anyway to try and at least prove to myself whether or not I can or cannot do that certain thing. So that's how I've been able to overcome a lot of the things that people have told me that I'm not going to be able to do that. And education was one of those big things that people said I wasn't going to be able to do it. Even after community college, I went on to Bible college to become a youth pastor because that's what I wanted to do. That's what I thought I had the calling on my life to do. There was a time there that one of the people sat me down and said, look, Dorsey, you're not doing well in classes. You're not, you know, you're struggling in this and that. You know, why don't you at least do, go and get your associate's degree? You know, that way, if you don't get your bachelor's degree, you at least have something to fall back on. So I did. Even during that time, in 2002, I lost my mom due to a stroke. She passed away on December 7th, 2002. But for the years later, on May 5th, 2005, I was able to cross the stage to receive my Battle of Arts degree in youth ministry. So once again, you're, you're proving people wrong all this time. I'm interested, though, because you've mentioned faith a number of times and a deep belief in God, but even during these times, were there moments that you would ask why, that you would reach out to God and say, why is this happening to me? Oh, absolutely. I did that multiple times throughout my lifetime. There was even times where I would hear other voices saying to me, Dorothy, you're not going to make it, you're not going to accomplish anything in your life. Why don't you just end your life and get it over with? Because that way you're not struggling anymore. You're not dealing with all the things that you have been dealing with. But yet God would remind me and say, I got greater things in store for your life. I have a better plan and purpose for your life than you could ever see or Imagine, and there was even time I would say, God, why would you, why would a loving and caring God make me the way that you did? And then he would bring me to the Psalm 139, um, 1316, where he talks about how we're made in our mother's room and how we're made in his image. And although it may be hard for some to imagine you know, why God would make someone like me in his image, I still believe that it was for a purpose. And I'm starting to see those purposes come to pass in my life. And you continue to go on and astound people with the things that that you're able to do. I imagine there are still struggles day to day that that you're facing. What are the the day to day things that you come up against now? Um, I think some of the day to day struggles is just thanking God I get up every day in my life, but also sometimes wondering at times when is the next health struggle? What's the next health struggle will I face? How long will I be able to live? If they say that people with my disability can live a normal life, 
But at the same time, you know, when you have a disability, you just don't know what's going to happen. For right now, thankfully, all my organs and my heart and everything, they all work properly and they all work normally. But sometimes, like everyday people, you get something on your leg or you get something on your arm. You're like, what is that? And, you know, you start to wonder, you know, especially with me, I start to wonder, you know, is that something I should be concerned about with my health and think of that nature? In the meantime, as you say, you were able to get your bachelor's degree in youth ministry. And it wasn't just study for the sake of study, but you've gone on to use that. Tell us a little bit about how you share your testimony with young people. Yeah, well, I started my own ministry, Dorsey Ministries, in 2007, and I've been traveling all all around the U.S. for the last 14 years now, sharing my story, and I've been invited to youth groups and been able to, you know, minister to the youth and speak into their lives and their just in all of what I've been able to, with God's help, what I've been able to overcome and what I've been able to, to do in my life. And my story is not a story of what with me and feel sorry for me, but it's a story of overcoming. It's a story of persevering in the midst of the trials that we face in each and every day of our life and that we have to overcome those trials and not allow those trials to hold us back. The struggles that you've faced are obviously going to be different to those, to the young people that you're talking to, but I'm sure that a lot of them see similarities with struggles that they're facing. What's some of the feedback that you've had from some of those young people where you've spoken? You know, a lot of it is just, hey, thank you for coming. You know, that was a great inspirational story that you gave to us. It really spoke to me and really spoke to my heart to know that God is there with me and that God is going to help me to get through this time in my life. And you mentioned that you've been travelling right around the USA for quite a number of years and speaking in different youth groups and I believe also speaking to church congregations. What sort of a welcome do you get when you go from place to place and, and talk about the things that God's brought you through? Most of the welcome is very warm and very welcoming. People are very happy, you know, to see me and to be able to hear my story. I was just at a church this past Sunday and they were very welcoming there. Even though there's a pandemic going on, they were hugging me and giving me handshakes and everything. There's a very welcoming atmosphere at a lot of these churches that I go to. I had a book signing because I had my own autobiography. So they were even able to buy my book at the end of the service as well. Tell me a little bit about the book. When did you decide that you needed to write down your story to share with others in that form? I had a lot of people, you know, throughout the years come up to me and say, hey, especially when I go to churches or speaking events, they would say, hey, when are you going to tell your story? When are you going to write your story? And I'd be like, eh, you know, I'm not thinking of myself as a writer. I don't think of myself as an author, although, you know, I am now. And people say, why don't you write your story? So it initially came out, the autobiography called Overcomer came out in 2016. And it took me about a good three or plus, three plus years now to write it. And now I came out with an updated edition in 2020. And now it's on it's on Kindle and on Amazon as well. So that's how, you know, that came to be. And it's, a, it's my story. It's just a story about my life and what I've been able to overcome. And it's just a, it gets into even deeper story about my life than what I would normally share from the dig or from the pulpit as well. How difficult was it for you to write down some of those deeper things, to go back and perhaps relive some of those hurts, as well as retelling the triumphs? 
Yeah, I don't know if it's that difficult, only because I was already somewhat telling those stories, but it did bring tears to my eyes when I would, as I was looking at it and editing it, going back and reading it, it would bring tears to my eyes to know, hey, this is what you've been through, and this is where you're at now, and look, look how far you've come in your life. Have you been able to be an encouragement perhaps to young parents who have a child with a disability of some sort? Oh, absolutely. I I definitely have. I've been on Facebook groups, you know, a lot of the times. I even met met with a a parent uh, a while back. They were from foreign country and they were visiting America and they were like, hey, we're going to be in your area. We'd like to meet up with you take you out to dinner, can we do that? I was like, sure, you know, so we met up and we got to talk in and as I am with you now, Rodney, so sharing my story of what, you know, what I've been able to overcome. And it must be a huge encouragement for them to know that even if the doctors say there's no hope or that your child will never reach this stage or that stage, that they don't have to believe them that there is a greater power at work. Right, um, definitely. I think that's it. I think too many times we listen to the doctors and they say, well, your child isn't going to make it, you know, then they'll give it up for adoption. Or like we talked about earlier, you know, they do the testing and they say, well, your, your child has aplets or your child has Down syndrome or any of these other number of disability and they say, well, your child doesn't going to make it. The parent may be talked into it. The parent may say, okay, well, we'll, we'll just, you know, abort this child because he's not going, he or she isn't going to make it. It obviously makes a big difference in a lot of people's lives. I'm wondering if people are wanting to get in touch with you or to find out more about your ministry, where is the best place for them to go? Yeah, the best place for them to go would be to go to my website, it's www.dorsheyrothministries.com. And I'll put a, a link to the website in the show notes at bleedingdaylight.net, as always, so that people can find you. If there are people going through struggles right now, if they're struggling with things that they're facing, what would you say to them? I would just say, you know what, don't allow those struggles and don't, don't allow those trials to hold you back from knowing and believing that you can do greater things, that you can do better things than what you are doing now. Don't allow the prognosis of what the doctor said to keep you down. Just believe in, in the healing, believe in that you will be able to overcome those prognoses that the doctor has given you. And that you can do it. You can become a greater thing that you can that you can do. And for those who are doubting God's goodness in the midst of a trial, what would you be saying to them? There's a Bible verse, you know, Romans eight twenty eight, and it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And sometimes we just need to know that when we're going through certain trials and we're going through certain difficulties that it's going to be a purpose and that God's going to use it for his good in the end after that trial is over. What are your plans for the future, Dorsey? What do you have in mind coming up, continuing with the the speaking circuit, speaking at different churches, or are there other things that you feel God's calling you to do? Yeah, well, for right now, I'm still going to do my best to do the traveling and do the speaking circuit. Right now, a lot of the opportunities are opening up for me to do what we're doing today, is to doing the shows on podcast and sharing my story this way. I'm excited to see, you know, where this takes me as well and how much of a reach that I can expand my story and expand the ministry this way. From the young child whose parents were told that there was no hope, to today, being someone with a bachelor's degree, who's on a speaking tour, who has published a book and continues to speak right around the world through podcasts, 
Uh, you're an amazing man, Dorsey, and we appreciate the time that you've spent with us. As I mentioned, we will put links to your website, but also to where people can get a hold of your book, Overcomer, in the show notes at bleedingdaylight.net. But Dorsey, thank you so much for spending some time with us today on Bleeding Daylight. Well, thank you, Vladimir, for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net.